thank you for dropping in to see the fifth in a video series that I'm calling Casting the Net. I'm Deacon John and today I'd like to discuss a topic that... Don't you just hate when that happens? I'm all set up to make a video and somebody's at the door. Hi, my name's Rusty and I'd like to take a minute and share the good news of Jesus Christ. But first, I have a question. Do you have a Bible in this house? Well, I have three of them. One is a very old one that belonged to my grandfather. He read it every day of his life. I also have a King James and one St. Joseph's Catholic Bible. Catholic? Well, why would you have one of them? Well, that's a man-made religion. Why, they're not even Christians. Well, one reason I have a Catholic Bible is that I am a Catholic. My name is Deacon John. And I'd probably have to disagree with what you just said, Rusty, but why don't you come in and we'll talk about it. Here, have a seat. Can I get you something to drink? No, thank you. Okay, but you let me know if you change your mind. Now, what makes you think the Catholic Church is a man-made religion? Well, my pastor says Catholics do a lot of things that are not in the Bible. He said that they invented most of their practices just to suit themselves. Don't you want to be saved? That depends. Now if you mean I want to exercise my free will and choose to follow Jesus for the rest of my life, the answer is yes. On the other hand, if you mean something that's done once, like a prayer or a pledge of some type, then I'd have to decline. Not that it doesn't sound inviting, but I just don't find any biblical or historical evidence that this is the way it was ever done. Now wait just a minute. I was saved on January 12, 2006. Ooh, then I guess I should have said it's never been done that way until January 12, 2006. Because in the Bible, there are conversion stories, but in each of those cases, it was a decision to follow Jesus, followed by a life of ongoing conversion. I'm sure you've read the letters from St. Paul, 1 Corinthians 9.27. Even after he had become the Lord's follower, Paul wrote, I drive my body and train it for fear, that after having preached to others, I myself shall be disqualified. Here, he's describing a lifelong process, and while it was unlikely, he was still free to backslide or even change his mind along the way. But why would he change his mind? If you're really born again, you don't change your mind. You accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior and your salvation is assured. Again, that sounds great, but you said, if you're really born again, does that mean there's a chance that even after saying the words to accept Jesus, you might not really be born again? Because that doesn't sound like much of an assurance. As a matter of fact, when St. Paul was speaking to the Corinthians about the gospel he preached, he said, Through it, you are also being saved if you hold fast to the word. The fact that he mentions holding fast indicates the possibility that there might be those who would let go. Now, I don't want to sound insulting, but in that light, the theology you're holding on to sounds less assuring and kind of man-made. While the Catholic belief is more in line with what it says in the Bible. Then of course there's history. Do you know how people became Christians in the early church? I don't. But what does that have to do with how they become Christians now? Well, first off, because St. Paul said, hold fast to scripture and tradition. To do that we need to know how those first Christians put their faith into action. After all, many of them knew Jesus during his lifetime. They were closer to the source than we are, and they're witnesses of great value to us. If the way people become Christians now is the same as in the time immediately following the Lord's resurrection, then you're on solid ground. If not, then it might be that some inventing took place in the centuries that followed. Well, Jesus said you have to be born again. True, but in the early church, when a person wanted to join, they had to have a sponsor, someone who was already in the church that taught them the faith and prepared them for initiation. This process sometimes took years. Now, in our time, the Catholic Church has a program called the RCIA, which means Rite of Christian Initiation. It's for people who want to join the church. 
They have to have a sponsor, and typically their preparation lasts about a year. So again, it seems to me that the Catholic method more closely matches the way it was done during the time of the Apostles. But what about worshiping the statues and confessing sins to a priest and purgatory? Oh, that's the problem, Rusty. When talking about the church, the subject is so broad that we can easily get sidetracked by moving from one topic to another. For now, let's just stick to a short salvation. You can come back some other time and we'll talk about something else. Well, I don't have anything else to say. You make it sound right, but I know you must be wrong. I just can't explain why. That's fine. We can call it a day. You think about what we discussed and feel free to come back anytime if you have any questions or if you just want to talk. I'm sure we've all met people like Rusty. Their love for Jesus is firm and they're definitely Christians. And their belief in assured salvation is very compelling, especially in our modern world where so many services are offered to us fast and easy. We have high-speed internet, drive-up banking, fast food, and much more. That being the case, I suppose it was just a matter of time before our society would create instant salvation, or what I call being mixed-saved. By contrast, Catholics believe that we are born again in baptism, but that choosing to follow Jesus is something that happens over and over, minute by minute, in a lifetime of ongoing conversion. We know that Jesus paid the price for our salvation, and we know that that's what He wants for us. We also know that life presents other choices along the way, and God has given us the freedom to make these choices, and then to live with the consequences. And while an assurance of salvation may at first sound pretty convenient, it overlooks one important aspect of our relationship with God, that being free will. After all, in order for us to really love God, there has to be the option for us to choose otherwise. In other words, for us to truly accept Him, we have to be free to reject Him as well. And to change our mind at one way or the other at any time. If assured salvation were possible, then imagine this scenario for a second. A person gets saved, then for whatever reason backslides or maybe even turns their back on God altogether. If at the time of their death they're still unrepentant, it really wouldn't matter because under the terms of their assured salvation, God would actually have to force that person, and if need be, drag them, kicking and screaming, into heaven. Now, Catholics are sometimes wrongly accused of performing good works in order to earn heaven. When the truth of the matter is that the good works are just visible signs of God's presence in our lives. They're what happens when the seed of God's word falls on good ground and produces a hundred or sixty or forty fold. That's the way Jesus described it in the Gospel. To put the shoe on the other foot, I'd like to suggest that when a person performs work with an expectation of a specified pay, that's called earning. And in that light, because the prayers and activity involved in getting saved require action, then it must be described as work. And if the specified expectation for having performed that work is salvation, then it looks to me like there are some well-intentioned Christians out there that have been incorrectly taught that salvation can be earned by performing this work that they refer to as getting saved. Well, that's about all the time we have for this video, but you can rest assured that I'll be making more of them in the future. And until next time, I'm Deacon John, doing my part to claim the internet for God, and wishing you Christ's peace.